uh, I have to tell you that, uh, of course, martial law was declared in 1972. I was uh, 12 years old then. I was in first year high school at Pasig Catholic College. So there were no newspapers, no TV stations uh, that were open, no radio broadcasts, because everything was closed down in September of 1972. But by word of mouth, we knew that martial law was declared. Actually, as far as I know, it was actually September 23. Marcos said it was September 21, but uh, uh, in reality, it was the 23rd when he uh, declared it. Um, I live in Pasig. Uh, this is Barangay Kapasigan. During that time, Pasig was still a, uh, a provincial town because Pasig was the capital of Rizal province. There was no Metro Manila yet in 1972. So it was a rural community. Just across our house, there, there would be rice fields. So in the barangay, it was called a barrio then, uh, where we lived, uh, our house was found in an esquinita located between two streets. And at night, there would be what we call uh, uh, agsasona. Okay? So there were police who were who used megaphones and called all the men to come down. Uh, this was in the early in the morning to come down and line up in the street. And then there would be someone pointing to supposed activists and then they would be arrested. So this happened in the other street the first night. Uh, my brothers and I did not, and my father did not go out because we said. But then at the other street on the next night, they will also ask all men to come out. And then again, there will be someone whose face was hooded, who will point who activists are. And these activists would be arrested. So I was 12 years old then. So I really didn't uh, know much about what was going on uh, in the country during that time. We operated a sari-sari store uh, where we sold rice. Uh, during the early years of martial law, people will line up to buy rice because there was a rice crisis. As a matter of fact, uh, rice was sold together with corn. So pinagahalo yung dalawa because uh, rice was not enough. So just remembering all of this, so how come they call it the golden years when, when people were uh, very poor, people were starving? Uh, the same is true with uh, queuing up to fetch water. Um, then uh, also during martial law, any grouping of three people was considered as in illegal assembly. So as children, when we were telling stories with co-barcadas, then police will come and tell, tell us, oh, you have to separate. Uh, don't group yourselves by five. It should only be limited to three people because four and above would be considered illegal assembly. Um, my high school days, uh, now that we have uh, reunions of my classmates, we don't have any pictures of our high school days because student organizations were banned. Student councils were banned. There was no uh, uh, school album where you have all the pictures of your classes and your classmates. So we considered ourselves as members of the lost generation because we don't have any evidence that we existed as a class because everything was banned during that time. Uh, now, uh, going to my 
college days. So I entered UP in 1976. I took up a course in anthropology, Bachelor of Arts in Anthropology. And because anthropology is very much interested in uh, indigenous peoples, uh, cultures of different Filipinos, so I got very much interested about the plight of our indigenous peoples. During that time, uh, starting from 1973, Marcos planned for the establishment of the Chico River Basin Hydroelectric Dam Project in the province of Kalinga Apayao and Mountain Province. So this project entails four hydro dams along the Chico River, which will inundate villages of the Kalinga and the Bontoc. 100,000 Kalinga and Bontok will be displaced because of this dam project. The government says, oh, you minorities have to sacrifice because this is for the benefit of the majority of Filipinos. But they plan to relocate Kalingas all the way to Palawan, so thereby leaving their burial grounds of their ancestors. So when, when I graduated uh, in 1980, I transferred to Baguio City and worked with indigenous peoples. In 1981, uh, there was a protest in Baguio City, a protest of Igorot students because the Ministry of Tourism then planned a tourist event known as the Grand Canyao. This happened before the Panagbenga. So this was in February of 1983. The Canyao, of course, is a sacred ritual among the Igorots. But the Ministry of Tourism wanted to commercialize the Canyao and use it for touristic purposes. So Igorot students opposed the Grand Ganyao. And uh, their organization was called PIGSA, Progressive Igorots for Social Action. In Ilocano, PIGSA means strength. I was not a member of that uh, demonstration because, uh, of course, I'm not an Igorot. I'm a Tagalog working in Manila. But the students were brutally dispersed by the police in Baguio City. And uh, later on, uh, particularly on March 7, 1983, I was part of a group of students distributing leaflets in Baguio City, along Session Road, I myself was uh, located in front of Baguio Central University, distributing leaflets protesting the violent dispersal of Igorot students. And this was when I was arrested by the police. So I was brought to Baguio City Jail. Uh, they took my fingerprints pictures of me, and then released me immediately. So I thought that was it. Now on March 9, or two days after, uh, the house of my girlfriend, uh, also in Baguio City, was raided by members of the Philippine Constabulary. I happened to be visiting my girlfriend during that time. And... Uh, the, the rest is history. So uh, we were brought to prison. So could I ask uh, the members of the technical committee to show the TikTok video that I uploaded about this particular incident? Yes, can you play it? Ako si Dr. Nestor Castro, 
isa akong cultural anthropologist. Tuwing naririnig ko yung mga nagsasabi na maganda ang buhay noong panahon ng martial law, kinikilabutan ako. Dahil para sa akin, ang panahon ng diktadurang Marcos ang pinakamalagim sa buong buhay ko. Dahil ako ay isang bilanggong politikal noong panahon ng martial law. Inaresto ako ng mga miyembro ng Philippine Constabulary noong March 1983 sa Baguio City. Wala silang dalang warrant of arrest, walang search warrant, at nakasibilyan sila. Hiniling ko na makausap ko muna ang aking lawyer, pero hindi ako pinayagan. Sa halip, dinala ako sa Camp Dangwa Benguet, kung saan ako ay tinorture. Pinaso ang aking dibdib, pinagtatadyakan, inumpog ang ulo sa pader, pinag-i-squat ng magdamag, at merong isang buong linggo na ako'y nakabartolina. Doon ako kumakain, doon ako natutulog, doon din ako umiihi at tumatae. Ito ay paglabag sa karapatang pangtao. Makalipas ang isang taon, nagdesisyon ang Baguio City Regional Trial Court na palayain ako dahil wala akong anumang kasalanan. Pero ano nang nangyari sa halos isang taon kong pagkakabilanggo para bang Wow, mali. Pasensya na. Wala ka palang kasalanan. Ganun na lang ba yun? Hindi ba mapaparosahan ang mga nagutos sa aking pagkakakulong at sa mga nagtorture sa akin? At mismong si Ferdinand Marcos ang nagutos sa aking pagkakaaresto sa bisa ng tinatawag niyang Presidential Commitment Order. Isang batas na siya mismo ang lumikha. Ayon sa kanya, sino mang dinidetain sa ngalan ng PCO ay walang anumang karapatan. Ngayon, isa na namang Marcos ang gustong bumalik sa Malacanang. Pero si Marcos Jr. ay walang pag-amin sa mga krimeng nagawa ng kanyang ama na at ng kanyang buong pamilya. Kasama na siya. Hindi niya pwedeng sabihin, hindi niya alam ang mga pangyayari dahil mas matanda pa siya kesa sa akin. Kinakailangan niyang aminin muna ang lahat ng kanilang krimen. Never again to a Marcos. Okay, uh, maraming salamat. So, kaya ko to gustong ipakita kasi uh, now it's a viral video on uh, TikTok. Uh, with 1.5 million views at uh, maraming nang babash sa akin karamihan ay mga pro Marcos Jr. Uh, bashers at uh, marami silang tanong at uh, let me take the opportunity para sagutin ang ilang mga tanong so uh, unang-unang tanong ay fake news ka di ba lifted na ang martial law noong 1981, January 17, 1981? E 1983 yung sinasabi mong uh, pagkakaaresto mo. Okay. So gusto ko yung sagutin. So let me uh, share my uh, screen para magpakita ng ilang mga uh, resibo. No? Okay. So... Uh, Okay, ito ang aking karanasan noong panahon ng diktadurang Marcos. Unang-una, January 17, 1983, Marcos allegedly lifted martial law. However, one day before, January 16, he issued Presidential Decree 1836, Series of 1981. Defining the conditions under which the president may issue orders of arrest or commitment orders during martial law or when the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus was is suspended. So, nilift on paper ang martial law, pero si Marcos pwede pa rin mag-utos 
kapag ang isang tao ay dinansagan na covered by PCO, yan, section 1, during a state of martial law, which was already lifted, or when the privilege of the rate of habeas corpus is suspended, siya yung makakapag-suspend doon, the president may issue orders of arrest or commitment orders to any person whose arrest or detention is in the judgment of the president required by public safety and as a means to repel or quell an invasion, insurrection, or rebellion, or imminent danger thereof. Ito yung sinasabi ko na kasi merong nagko-comment, hindi naman si Marcos ang umaresto sa'yo. Bakit mo sasabihin si Marcos? Si Marcos ang nag-issue ng PCO at ako, kasama ng girlfriend ko at iba pang mga estudyante noon sa Baguio, ay inaresto sa visa ng PCO na si Marcos ang nakapirma. Okay? Nilift ang martial law, pero martial law powers remained under such presidential decrees. They were not scrapped from 1981 until 1986. So I would consider it as paper lifting of martial law. So ito yung litrato ko na, na nasa selda ko. Merong nag-comment, hindi hmm, naman ikaw yan eh. Tignan mo ang buhok, iba. Eh, Diyos ko, this is 39 years ago. Ang payat-payatot ko. Tapos hindi nga ako naliligo sa kulungan. Hindi masyadong nakakakain. Kaya ganyan ang itsura ko. Actually, ang mother ko as well as the relatives of other detainees at Camp Dangwa were the first ones to complain. So sila ang lumapit sa Baguio City Trial Court with the assistance of FLAG, the Free Legal Assistance Group. So meron na namang nagkomento sa TikTok, eh bakit hindi ka nagdemanda? Bakit hindi ka nagsampa ng kaso? Eh kami nga po ang nagsampa ng kaso because there was no case filed against us. So uh, eto, uh, we filed a case for habeas corpus. Ano? Uh, yung mga hindi walang background sa law, I know most of you have background in law, to produce the body why we are being held in prison. So uh, maliit yung text, uh, but this clipping comes from the gold ore. I am quite lucky because my mother collected news clippings about what transpired during that time. So my lawyers... Because there was no warrant of arrest and there was no PCO. Ang sagot ni General Asada ng Philippine Constabulary Region 1, ito yung nasa heading ng newspaper, PC or the Philippine Constabulary, to file charges against the four detainees. So, wala pang charges. Magfa-file pa lang, pero nakakulong na. Ano? Uh, ang date ng newspaper, April 13, uh, sorry, is that April 3, ako kinulong March 9. So this is illegal detention. At ano ang sinasabi ni General Asada? They have already applied for the issuance of a presidential commitment order. April 3, wala pang PCO. At eto, ayun ako, yung may bigotes na with a striped shirt. Ano? Four students detained since March 9 were presented in court last Tuesday following the plea for habeas corpus filed by flag lawyers. One detainee, Nestor Castro, second from left, reported that he was allegedly tortured. The judge ordered that I be examined. Uh, in uh, 
uh, Baguio City General Hospital. But the Philippine Constabulary only allowed that I be examined one month after the order. And so my bruises were no longer there. Ito kami ng mga prisoners sa Camp Bado Dangwa in Benguet. That's me on the right at the back. And uh, the, the woman second from the left was my girlfriend then. Uh, she's no longer my girlfriend. And uh, we were uh, held together. Uh, first in the same cell, but later on, we were transferred to uh, different cells. I transferred to the cell with the other male detainee who I did not know beforehand because his was another case. Uh, uh, he was suspected to be a member of the New People's Army in Abra. Okay. Uh, the two other students, the two at the middle, uh, one is from uh, Pangasinan and the other one from Baguio Colleges Foundation, now the University of the Cordilleras. The woman at the right, uh, again, uh, she was arrested separately from us. We only met her in prison. Uh, she also comes from Abra and being charged for uh, subversion. Okay. Uh, this is the picture of us in, from another point of view. Again, one question from TikTok. Akala ko ba walang karapatan noong martial law? Eh bakit kayo nalilitratuhan? Okay. Members of uh, the Baguio Press were able to sneak in and get our uh, pictures and this was released in public. And this was how the public knew that we were being incarcerated. So the first month, my mother didn't know that I was in prison. But because of these pictures, she found out that I was in prison and then visited me after a month. Fortunately, fortunately or unfortunately, in the morning of her visit, I don't remember anymore the date, I was just tortured by a PC lieutenant. And when uh, my mother was allowed to meet me, kinakamusta ko. So, kamusta ka na anak? Sabi ko, eto po, katotorture lang sa akin. Ayan po yung nagtorture. Tinuro ko yung uh, PC officer. Tapos sagot naman ng PC officer, masyado namang crybaby ang anak nyo. Ano naman eh, kinikiliti lang naman namin eh. eh reklamo na ng reklamo. Uh, may mga in prison pa pala, maraming pinapirma sa aking mga documents na sinasabi na arrested daw in the house of my girlfriend. I did not want to sign it because they were not mine. Pero sinasabi ng PC, hindi, ano lang yan, SOP. Just sign it. Ganyan. So ako, under duress, napilitan akong pirmahan. Buti na lang, meron akong konting katinuan sa pag-iisip. So I signed every page with my signature. And after my signature, I wrote UP. When the, uh, the soldiers were asking me, oh, bakit may UP dyan? Eh, because I'm a graduate of UP, I said. Pero in court, I told the judge, I signed all of these documents under protest because they were not mine. I was forced to sign it. There were no lawyers allowed to act as witness. Pero itong mga documents na ito, jaryo uh, ng UP Baguio, posters ng Episcopal Commission on Tribal Filipinos about the Chico Dam Project, at isang katawa-tawa, songbook ng Asin, yung band na Asin. Sa korte, tinanong ng judge doon sa mga polis, alin dyan sa mga documents na yan ang subversive? So hanap ng hanap yung isang 
police chief. By the way, that police chief was never a part of the arresting party. Kasi yung nag-arrest sa amin, mga members of PC intelligence. Eh, dahil ayaw nilang ipaharap sa korte yung supposedly intelligent people, nagpaharap sila ng mga pulis na hindi naman sila ang nag-aresto sa amin. So nakita nung police chief yung songbook ng asin at tinignan niya. Sabi niya, eto, ako ay isinilang sa isang bayan ng Cotabato. Of course, kanta yung ng asin. Ano? Ako ay isinilang sa isang bayan ng Cotabato. Sabi nung police, we all know that Cotabato is a haven of the NPA. Therefore, these students are members of the NPA. So ganun ang nangyayari sa korte. Uh, we went on hunger strike. So this is from the Gold War, a newspaper in Baguio. So the date there is November 6. Every, first, we had what we call foodless Thursdays every, uh, every Thursday starting November. But in December, starting December 1, we went on hunger strike. Ibig sabihin talagang wala nang kinakain for the whole day. So ako yung nasa middle, uh, payatot pa rin. And with our shirts, we are on fast for our release. Okay? So it says here, six students indefinitely detained at Camp Dangwa went on hunger strike last November 3 to demand their immediate release. Detainees Brenda Subido, Nestor Castro, Josephine Soriano, Elina Velasco, Cristina Rodriguez, and Benjamin Briones are staging a once-a-week fast every Thursday for 24 hours to dramatize their stand. Now, anong epekto nito? Later on, naka-attract ng attention sa public in Baguio. There would, we would have visitors, people we don't know, such as religious nuns, market vendors, journalists, who would come to the detention cell bring food for us, and then talk with us. We were very happy when the nuns would uh, visit us. We would have prayer meetings kasi wala nga kaming mga visitors. We were not allowed to interact with the outside world. Yung market vendors nagdala ng mga gulay. Tapos sabi namin, salamat po, pero pasensya na kami po ay nag-hunger strike. So sasabihin ng mga nanay na market vendors, nakukumain kayo, kawawa naman kayo. Uh, pag aalis na sila sa visit, ako talagang mababa ang luha ko. Lumuluha na ako kasi bakit ganun? Hindi ko naman sila kilala. Bakit nila kami sinusuportahan? So ito yung naramdaman ko sa, sa prison. Okay. So another picture, I, I think I got just got a haircut there. Uh, we are on fast for our release. This is in front of Baguio City Hall. Then December comes, we were making Christmas cards. Uh, yon, December 1 to 10, fasting for freedom. Um, I should also mention that aside from physical torture, what was worse was mental torture. Every night when I was already sleeping, uh, there would be someone coming to my cell, opening the, the gate of the cell, and then waking me up, and then asking me to go down. Because this is a, the, the detention area was on top of a hill. And down below was the off. Office of the Philippine Constabulary. So I would be interrogated by uh, officials, and every night, every every time, they would have a new allegation. So at first, 
there were no charges against us. But then, we are charged for possession of subversive materials. Later on, there would be new charges. Subversion. Later on, new charges. Use of fictitious names to conceal a crime. So may tatlong cases na final sa, sa amin. Ano? Uh, para tumagal at tumagal yung kaso sa korte. Uh, I consider the mental torture as worse because every time, every night that I would hear the footsteps of the guards, the creaking of the gate, the metal gate, I will begin to shake. I know that again I will be interrogated. That was why when I was already released for a year, probably for a year, when I would be walking at the streets and then there's a car that would stop nearby, I would immediately shake. This was the impact on me. This was the trauma that, that I had. I hope I don't have that trauma anymore. But now listening to stories about uh, torture again brings back this dark memories about martial law. Uh, this is almost Christmas in uh, the jail. Now, medyo suerte kami ng konte. Again, suerte or hindi suerte kasi mayroong unfortunate events. This was 1983. I was arrested in March. Ninoy Aquino was assassinated in August. So nakakulong kami nung mangyari ang Aquino assassination. At sa Manila, every day merong protests against Marcos because of the assassination of Nino Aquino. So President Marcos transferred Nila! From, Nila! from Manila. Uh, President Marcos, hatiya, meron nagsasagita. President Marcos transferred from Manila to Baguio City to escape this rallies in Metro Manila. And while he was in Baguio, that was when we staged our hunger strike. So before December 10 happened, which was the Human Rights Day, Marcos called us in Baguio City. We met Marcos. We were announced on television that he is ordering our release. And the reason for this, he says, is in the spirit of national reconciliation. But his hidden agenda is para umiwas na ang Baguio, hindi parang Manila na everyday meron na namang rally just because of our imprisonment. So this is an interview with us by the newspaper, the Weekly Highlander. Newspaper then, you will see two pesos. Uh, below, uh, let me read because uh, the text is too small. Nestor Castro, an anthropologist suffering from a rheumatic heart, hadn't been as lucky. He says that on March 26, or two weeks after his arrest, he was manhandled by his arresting officer. He was brought to Montemayor Hospital for me medical examination a week later, but only after his mother and lawyers interceded on his behalf. Sa TikTok kasi, marami akong nare-receive. Iisang litrato lang ay pwedeng i-fake yan. Ano ang pruweba mo na ikaw ay nakulong? Nako, dokumentadong dokumentado po. At dahil nga sa paghalukay ko ng mga dokumentong ito, again, bumabalik sa aking memory ang dinanas na pang-aabuso sa akin. So it's not really easy for us to talk about this. Merong ding nagsabi sa TikTok, bakit ngayon ka lang nagsasalita? Kasi election, uh, meron akong pinost lang kagabi, paki-follow na lang sa TikTok, ng isang video ko noong 
2016 noong nilibing si Marcos sa libingan ng mga bayani kung saan kinikwento ko na noong 2016 ang aking karanasan. Eh bakit 2016 lang? Siguro yan na naman din ang itatanong. Kasi wala pang TikTok nung kapanahunan namin. Ano? At maraming matatanda either patay na or hindi marunong gumamit ng social media. Ako medyo kaya ko to kasi ang ka-interact ko ay mga estudyante kong kabataan pa rin. No? So, yun. Ano? Uh, meron pang nagsabi na medyo flattering. Ano? Sabi, Ako, parang kasing edad mo lang ang kuya ko eh. Maniwala akong buhay ka na nung martial law. Wow! Uh, that's a compliment. Ang gusto kong isagot dyan, eh kasi bang pa-facial din kayo at pumunta rin sa hair salon every week. Ano? <laughs> uh, nabanggit naman siguro kanina na, that I appear also on television. So, eh, <laughs> kasalanan ko ba na mukha akong bata? <laughs> anyway, uh, ito yung uh, from Baguio Midland Cour- Courier, December 11, 1983, free at last. It will be a Merry Christmas for 15 political detainees. Bakit naging 15? Kasama ang iba pang detainees from La Union. Uh, detainees in Camp Dangwa, Benguet and in San Fernando, La Union as President Marcos last week ordered their temporary release. Temporary lang. Ha? Uh, so, okay. Uh, In the photograph, those released are Brenda Subido, Nestor Castro, Josephine Soriano, Elena Velasco, Maria Cristina Rodriguez, Benjamin Briones, Romulo Tuason, Genoveva Luagan, all at Camp Dangwa. Tapos meron pa from La Union. Uh, unfortunately, do sa litrato, ayun si Marcos sa left, ako yung ulo sa likod. So wala akong picture talagang katabi si Marcos. Ano? Uh, at sa nga pala, yung nasa likod ko are soldiers holding my body para hindi ko itulak si Marcos. Ano? Si Marcos kasi nung panahong ito, may karamdaman na ng lupus. Masyado na siyang mahina. Ang balat niya, at uh, ano na, yung tuldok-tuldok na ganyan, polka dots, at ang hawak niya sa akin dahil kinamayan niya ako, Parang nakapatong na lang. Ganun na siyang kawik. Kaya kung talagang tinulak ko, wow, bayani siguro ako ngayon. Ano? Uh, pero hawak-hawak ako ng mga sundato. So sa picture sa gitna, ayun si uh, girlfriend ko, si Joy Soriano. Ako yung nasa likod again. Picture sa kanan, ako yung nagsasalita sa microphone na nagpapasalamat ako sa lahat ng nagsuporta sa aming hunger strike. Ito, uh, picture sa kanan, yung gwapong yan, ang aming lawyer, si Pablito Sanidad ng Free Legal Assistance Group. Okay? He's now Vice Mayor in uh, uh, Ilocos Sur. Ako yung uh, nasa left, uh, halos butot balat. Uh, yung dalawang nasa likod ko ay mga prisoners din, ano, na na-release. The day after our temporary release, ako ito, you, pareho ang suot na damit, nagsasalita sa isang rally sa UP Baguio kung saan nagpapasalamat ako sa Baguio students for supporting us. Yung poster sa upper right, yun ang litrato namin sa prison. So naging rallying call kami ng mga taga Baguio during that time. Okay? Pero ako, isa lamang sa mga biktima ng martial law o ng Marcos dictatorship. According to data, more than 70,000 people have been arrested during martial law. May nagsasabi pa sa TikTok, political detainee ka pala, eh di komunista ka. Ano? So pag political, <laughs> ibig sabihin, Iba ang iyong political views kesa sa present government. Hindi necessarily komunista. At kahit komunista man o aktivista, meron silang civil rights. Meron silang human rights. 
Kasi lagi sinasabi sa TikTok, pasaway ka siguro. Dapat lang ang mga pasaway talagang pina, kinukulong. Buti nga buhay pa, buhay ka pa eh. Dapat pinatay ka na. Yan ang mga comment na natatanggap ko sa TikTok. 34,000 ang na-torture kabilang ako. 3,240 ang napatay. So, tinatanong bakit hindi kami nagreklamo? Kasama po kami sa nag-file ng case against the Marcos estate. Finile ito sa Hawaii at sa Texas. At nanalo kami kung kaya't nakatanggap kami ng ilang dolyares. Barya-barya lang mga una $1,500, sumunod ganun din yata mula sa confiscated assets ng mga Marcoses noong pumunta sila sa US. Okay. Uh, I think I don't have much time, pero ito ang isang statement ng UP Department of History nung ilibing si Marcos noong 2016. And it is still very relevant today. Uh, do I still have time? If yes, I will read it. If not, uh, I will skip it. Uh, meron... Yes po, Dr. Okay. Meron po. So ito yung statement ng UP Department of History ang title, Malakas at Maganda, The Marcos Reign, Myth-Making and Deception in History. The darkness of dictatorship descended upon the Philippines when Marcos declared martial law in 1972 and the dictator ruled the nation with impunity. Great danger now lurks behind a deceptive nostalgia for a past that never really existed, that the Marcos years were a period of peace and prosperity. This is patently Marcos myth and deception. Under martial law, the country was plunged into a climate of repression and plunder and then into a social crisis that exploded in the 1980s. Marcos myth-making and deception are not new. Martial law itself was set up by, the, by grand deception. Marcos raised the red scare to justify martial law. But the communist movement then was still in its infancy. It was in fact under martial law that the communist and Moro rebellions grew in leaps and bounds. Marcos claimed to break up an old oligarchy, but martial law instead created a new type under his control, a crony oligarchy. Marcos also couched his dictatorship in deceptive legalese called constitutional authoritarianism. But it only served his yearning for perpetual key in power. The fact is, martial law rudely preempted the 1971 Constitutional Convention, which sought to prohibit Marcos from extending his hold on power. He thereafter ruled for 14 years until he was ousted. To prop up authoritarian control, the Marcos propaganda machine contrived decep deceptive images of Philippine society as in the slogans, New Society and the City of Man. Yung tinutugtog ngayon sa mga rally ni Marcos Jr. na may bagong silang. Naku, ito yung pinapakanta sa amin nung high school kami. At pag hindi mo kabisado yung kanta, pinapaginugulti-gulti ka. Tapos ito ngayon ang simbolo daw ng unity. Which sought to paint a picture of a compassionate society. But Imelda Marcos actually put up a whitewash fences to hide urban blight and squalor from foreign tourists. The Marcoses also portrayed themselves in the likeness of the legendary persona of Malakas and Maganda in the Filipino origin myth, which made them appear in front, front of life, fount of life in murals 
and photographic visuals. Makikita nyo to sa Philippine Heart Center for Asia. But the dictatorship actually engendered some of the darkest and direst years of Philippine history. Economic crisis characterized the Marcos years as economists have consistently revealed. The most stalling indicator was the extent of poverty. Poverty incidents grew from 41% in the 1960s to 59% in the 1980s. Vaunted growth was far from inclusive and driven by debt. Palaki ng palaki ang ating utang. Which further weighed down on the nation. From 1970 to 1983, foreign debt increased 12 times and reached $20 billion. It grew at an average rate of 25% from 1970 to 1981, much went to unproductive expenses like the Bataan nuclear plant, which was unsound and wasteful. The Marcos regime then imposed an IMF debt repayment program that resulted in new taxes, massive layoffs, and a towering inflation that stood at 54% in 1984, while wages nominally rose by 29%. Prices increased by 92%, and the economy declined by 5.5% in 1984. From mid-1970s, the situation resulted in massive outflow of labor overseas. Kaya tayo merong mga bagong bayani OFW kasi walang hanap buhay sa Pilipinas mula ng mga panahong ito. The grinding poverty of the majority showed in a sharp increase in two areas, infant mortality and insurgency. Crime rates increased rebellion surge. So it was not a time of peace. It was a time of crime, including high crime coming from the dictator himself. So mahaba pa yung sinasabi rito. So uh, let me end with the sad thing indeed that could happen is to fall for the trap of seeking a better society from a mythical golden past. In the past, Marcos' myth-making served to hide the power grab and greed of malakas at maganda. Today, Marcos' deception seeks to evade accountability. We reject deception and demand accountability from the Department of History of UP Diliman in 2016, but still very valid now because we have a lot of deception that go, is going around that right now. Again, sa TikTok ko, may nagsasabing, ang kasalanan ng ama ay hindi kasalanan ng anak. Pero sinasabi ko nga, yung anak walang pag-amin sa kasalanan ng kanyang ama. At hindi totoo na wala siyang alam. Ang sinasabi ko nga, mas matandas pa si Bongbong kesa sa akin. Kung ako may muwang na nun, eh di lalo pa si Marcos Jr. So ito yung balikan natin yung, ito yung last slide ko. Ito yung picture namin sa Camp Dangwa, which was used by task force detainees as a poster that says, No person shall be detained solely by reason of his or her political beliefs and aspirations. This is found in the Philippine Bill of Rights. Free all political prisoners. And the picture is from political detainees at Camp Bagodangwa Benguet in La Trinidad Benguet, 1983. So this ends my uh, presentation of what I experienced in the so-called golden years of martial law. Thank you very much.